Okay, it's 11.05, so we'll make a start. Uh, my name is Linda Devlin. I work at the University of Wolverhampton, but most significantly today, I'm a member of IPDA, and I'm involved with IPDA England, and effectively today's event has been organised by IPDA England. But of course, as usual, it's in collaboration with other interested parties. So obviously, um, Lizana and Paul, thank you very much, are here uh, to present their the main points from their paper, which is actually a USEP paper. Uh, so the University Council for the Education of Teachers, and I believe that Lizana and Paul are both members of the CPD group of that organisation. And I am delighted that they've got round to producing this paper and it's given us a lot to talk about and I felt very much that we need to share it as widely as possible. So it's networks within networks, which is my ideal scenario. I'm a great believer in collaboration uh, and hopefully we can make those links and be stronger as a profession for that. Um, we've also got here today Pauline Smith, who chairs the IPDA England group. So I just acknowledge that Pauline, who might still be having her technical problems, is around and I'm sure she'll have something to say. <laughs> I am definitely around. Sorry about that photograph. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it'll go. I know, I know. I, I hadn't got you down as a, a selfie person, but I'm going <laughs> to get you one of those now. Okay. <laughs> So Pauline and I go back a long way. I won't bore you with the details, but she used to be my boss at one point in time, I believe, in some some small way. But we worked at MMU together and we've been working together ever since. And we've been members of it, uh, or at least I have ever since. And that's a long time. We won't talk about years. Okay. <laughs> so um, without further ado, um, the paper that has been produced by Lizana and Paul with two of the colleagues, I'm sure they'll tell you all about it, uh, as a, um, a discussion paper, a draft paper, to pull together uh, all of the important things about effective CPD, which I was, I have to say, delighted to see that that was happening because in my head uh, it's becoming one big, huge jigsaw uh, that people have to make sense of and actually there are points where you don't even know if you've got all the right pieces uh, that make up some sort of overview picture. And uh, so as usual, metaphors are the way I tend to think about it, but I'm absolutely sure that the profession in general, um, who are not looking necessarily at the strategic ins and outs, um, do have trouble working out sometimes exactly what is the nature of the professional learning in education. Uh, and I think this paper helps us enormously to start to uh, get a clearer idea of how this is working for people. Um, so I'll stop there for now and uh, I will introduce Lizana and Paul and let them lead you through that paper and those ideas. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Linda. Um, um, I'm going to start, I believe, because uh, Lizana and I had a quick chat last night about how we play this. Um, I'm Paul Vare. I am the chair of the USET CPD Forum, and Lizana is my very able vice chair. And uh, we kind of do, do a double act when we have these forums. Some of you, I think, are familiar from, from those. Um, uh, my job today is really just to introduce the paper, which I think you've all had a chance to have a look at. Um, so we're not going to uh, hit you with slides on this on, on a Saturday morning. Um, just to, what I'm going to do is just give a very brief background to why the paper arose, how it was, how it came about. Um, and we finished the paper really by going back to the start and producing a short summary of the main points that came from it. And uh, Lizana will go on to those, you know, the main learning points that came from the paper. So just to say by introduction, um, we drafted this as a result of a meeting back in September uh, 2020, the beginning of the academic year. There was a lot of change afoot. Um, Linda was talking about jigsaw puzzles. I think the way government thinking is it's more like Lego blocks, very simplistic, um, uh, well, you could say very um, clear, uh, uh, logical thinking, a linear pathway from the core content framework into the early career framework into national professional qualifications, the MPQs, um, 
it's all there sorted out for you in, in a number of boxes that need to be ticked and, and gone through. Um, and it's kind of a production line approach. Um, you can see it's all about efficiency and covering all the main bases as, as they are perceived by, by the government of the day. And we just felt, well, what do we think CPD should be? So rather than snipe at this, um, uh, as if I didn't just all do that, um, it was the uh, approaches to kind of appreciative inquiry. What do we think is good CPD? And the idea was to bring together the, the kind of collective intelligence of the forum members. Um, and that included colleagues from Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, as well as England. So the four jurisdictions could talk about principles of CPD rather than just the politics of it, because it would be different in each of our jurisdictions. So that was quite a valuable cross fertilization of ideas to start with. Um, the other thing was that uh, um, I guess when you thought about all the people in that four, it's, it's rather like this, there's a whole <laughs> screen of, of names. Um, and I guess without being too rude about it, there were centuries of experience um, of um, good de dedicated professionals delivering um, and, and developing uh, good professional development for, for, for teachers, young and old. And so by having that in, in this kind of virtual room, we were able to have a very wide range of discussion. Um, we were gathering all the points, there were sort of overlapping points and certain issues started to really kind of come up. But, and I, I think that's why I should stop there and let that go on to, to Lizana. But um, in terms of the issues, what we did with that was we reflected on that meeting, how rich it was. We looked at that as kind of data and we did a sort of a qualitative analysis of that. And we thought we should add a bit of the literature which was being hinted at or referred to directly in the meeting. Um, and we went back to some research as well. So we said, well, who would volunteer to help us write this up? We need a very small group to, to make a good job of this. And so Cathal Butler from Bedfordshire, um, Justin Dillon, Exeter, Lizana and myself um, got to work on this. Um, uh, I think we divided it up. I think Lizana was looking at policies and uh, historical background and Cathal was looking at, at uh, I think, history. Um, I know Justin was looking at uh, the research background, what does that tell us? And I was doing a sort of a topping and tailing of all that and, and helping to, to draft the thing. Um, so we came up with this paper and in a way we were a bit surprised. We just thought there is a very clear statement of what the, the, the field of, um, of, of professionals feel makes good CPD. And we had a bit of an iterative process. We shared it with the executive, with the whole forum and a little bit of just checking and and finessing of it. And, and there it is, the paper that we shared with you. Um, in terms of what it actually says, um, I'm going to hand over to Lizana. Um, but there's just yeah. one point I wanted to make because it's not clear from the list of bullet points exactly. We talk about um, the um, uh, sort of responsible professionals is one of the bullet points. And I think what we I'd like to maybe say there is about the values that underpin our work. Um, and there's a more there's a, there's human values there, and there are a, a wider version of what education is for society, and I think that's what's really well. I'm not going to say missing, but it's something that we felt came through the discussion, um, and uh, that's uh, that's uh, something I, sort of broader issues of what kind of world do we want to live in, um, uh, and education does after all reflect the society that we we have, um, so but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that with there. Um, I see a question about the title of the paper. And uh, what I can tell you is it is simply called the uh, USET discussion paper on continuing professional development. But uh, I will actually can share it in the chat if you like. But, yeah. um, uh, I can see Paul has done that. Thanks, Paul. Um, yes, well, basically one, one of the things we want to amplify here is, is we, we had these conversations a long time uh, and for a long time before um, the reforms for the MPQs came into play and also even the early careers framework. We really wanted to tease out what, what are the key principles of um, effective CPD, good CPD. And, and so for us, it's a set of principles rather than necessarily a list or a checklist or characteristics even. It, it's very much the underpinning principles. And we, as, as Paul was saying, try to distill all the voices of um, colleagues from USET, all the expertise. Um, and what was really remarkable when we looked at the history also of CPD and how CPD offers were 
presented um, since 1972. It dates back all the way to then, just before I was born. Um, so it tells you how much experience was in the room who contributed and shared in this, this piece of work. Um, what, what really came from that was that, first of all, um, the first bullet point is, is that it really had to expand competencies and that CPD needed to be context specific. So um, it, there's no such thing as one size fits all. It depends on the context, the needs of the individuals we work with and that, that we all felt very strongly about. And then the second point was that um, it had to be research informed. It had to be underpinned by, by good practice research and had to be rich in, in its very nature and had to engage educators in theory as well, not just the practice. It had to explore what underpins the practice. Um, it had to be reflective practice as well and develop reflect, reflection and reflexive practitioners. Um, in addition to that, trusted relationships and with that then um, aligns it with the practices of coaching and mentoring and how those, those practices will enable people to grow and develop and flourish within organizations um, and work with each other collaboratively and professionally. Um, so that came out very strongly from all the, um, the views we looked at and also the, the actual um, historic um, rollout of the CPD that we've looked at in the past as well. In addition to that, it also had to be sustained over time. So it, it wasn't just a quick fix. It had to be looked at as, as, a, as an ongoing lifelong learning process. And what was interesting was um, many views were that it had to be a minimum of at least um, two terms sometimes. Um, so there's a real clear sense that it had to be a long term commitment and it had to really develop that person's thinking um, over a sustained period of time. And also then, as Paul was saying, it had to develop responsible um, professionals and, and how values underpin that responsible approach and practice. And in addition to that, then teachers had to develop agency um, and give themselves permission to, to explore, to be critical, to reflect, to try to address things, to find solutions, to work with others. Um, and I think that's a really important point as well, that sense of agency that you can also drive that journey and your learning journey. Um, and it had to be robust and the quality assurance of that had to be in place very robustly. Um, so in a nutshell, when we really distilled all those points, these were the principles that came out of that. And our, our intention with this paper is to really encourage people to discuss this further. And um, as Paul was saying, it, it's, it's not a fait accompli. Um, we wanted to share that with people to continue the conversation as we are today, to again expand on that and also continue to, to reflect on what other print principles would we like to add to that, how can we enrich it further and, and what else do we require of CPD. Anything else you want to add, Paul? No, thank you very much. That, that's, that's fine, Isan. I think you've covered the, the main points there. Fantastic. And I think today is an opportunity for the panel, first and foremost, to, to first raise their points and perspectives on this. Um, anything else that we would like to add, as well as to colleagues from then our, um, I, I want to say the floor, the virtual floor, anything you want to add. I think today is a real opportunity for us to capture additional thoughts and additional principles and see how we can continue to grow and develop this thinking regarding um, CPD and the principles of CPD that we would like to see in, in our own organisations and beyond. Um, and also a real opportunity for us perhaps to also lead on that and, and, and take ownership and give ourselves agency to say, but you know, that's what we would really like to see in, in practice um, to develop and help others to grow. So um, Pauline and Paul Campbell, any thoughts from you? Um, I do have a question, actually. Uh, you mentioned early on about the, the discussion, the way that it was across England, Wales, Scotland. How much of Ireland, uh, actually, would you say uh, was involved? So it's just out of interest, um, you know, from certainly from the IPTA Association, the way in which we work right across <laughs> um, uh, many different associations. So I just wondered how much of Ireland you managed to involve there. It was the, sorry, it, it was the chair of the I can't remember his name. Is it Martin? Um, yes, we um, we have a Ireland um, 
I want to say branch, um, but that might not be the correct term, but it, uh, USET also has a Northern Ireland um, right. affiliation. And right. we had meetings with, with Martin, who was the chair, and the paper was emailed out to all the um, USET members um, and, and all their, their, their representatives to comment yeah. and feedback on. And, and we had those, feed, those comments coming through as well. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Else, that, 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 that's really powerful, the way in which you, you collaborated to, to produce this paper. And I, I think that this is um, a paper that is of interest to, to many of us. Um, as you can tell, now that I'm on the video, <laughs> uh, I've been around a long time, so way before the, you know, the National CPD Strategy, so that, and uh, the, the whole history uh, part, it's just great to read it again, since uh, I, for one, have, have written lots about the history of CPD. But uh, I, you know, I just um, I just wanted to say that it is of real interest, and certainly to Ipta, and I'm sure Paul will echo this when he speaks. Um, and there may be more that we can do across the associations. Uh, we have uh, uh, eleven different associations in, in Ipta now, uh, so that so there may be more that you can actually gather uh, to to formulate um, your thinking to, to to strengthen the thinking. I think for me, having reread the paper just now. Um, and the sort of the work I'm involved in, in with schools at the moment and, you know, grassroots and uh, trainee teachers and so on. I think the very practicality, the very practical challenges that we have in relation to CPD in terms of its uh, implementation, its coherence, uh, the collaboration and the quality. I'm not sure that that sort of like shines out through the paper, the actual challenges that we have as a profession at the moment. Uh, which are really considerable, um, in my opinion, in terms of the whole fragmentation, uh, in terms of what's happening. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, would love to collaborate more, uh, contribute more. Um, I couldn't see a lot about relationships to appraisal and performance management, which potentially, I'm going to be really argumentative here, may be one of the few mechanisms that, you know, in some schools, whereby CBD has, you know, sort of a... a a major highlight, if you like, or a way in, um, and how uh, uh, similarly with the whole leadership and management of CPD in schools uh, and across schools and across trusts, particularly uh, the, the way that things have developed. So that's just just a few comments from me. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the discussion and, and perhaps of ways forward that IPTA actually could help to to uh, collaborate with the USET, if you like on this paper uh, and help to develop it further. So um, over to Paul from Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you to uh, Lizanna and Paul for the really interesting paper. And it's great to see today that we've got um, so many contexts, geographical regions and sectors represented as well. I noticed that we've got uh, business and marketing represented as well. And I think that while um, a lot of the discussion might have focused on um, professional development, career long professional learning, in the context of teaching and education. I think there's some really clear application to other sectors as well, which is really exciting, I think, in this paper. And what this actually stimulated for me is a lot of connections to the work of, other, the, of the other IPTA associations and some of the conversations that have been happening over the previous few years as well, which has been both reassuring but also interesting as well. And I think what was clear was about the, the various conceptualizations of continuing professional development whether in other places it might be called career-long professional learning or whatever other um, acronyms might be used for it, but actually about how it's starting to indicate and lead us to, I guess, broader conceptualizations that take account of other factors with things like you've mentioned already with agency, but also with concepts of power and professionalism as well. And I think that the element we were discussing around agency in relation to continued professional development or career-long professional learning is key. And I think that it's about, I guess, when we look to ecological models of agency and looking at what are some of the broader systemic influences on it in terms of structures, systems, mechanisms, relationships, these are all really important factors when we're thinking about, it links to what uh, Maya Means mentioned already in the chat about actually what individuals look for from the CBD experience. It's about understanding the environments they're operating in. And I think this leads us, and I think the paper itself leads us to some really interesting questions and I guess some future work as well around the forms that CBD takes, the, the drivers of it and the influences importantly on CBD that exists elsewhere as well. Because 
if we think about the forms that CBD does take in various contexts, I always find REITs quadrants um, really, really helpful there thinking about the informal and formal opportunities people have access to that are both planned and unplanned and actually using that as an exercise to map out what individuals have access to and what that might indicate about the level of agency they can exercise in relation to their CBD, but also who holds the power in this dynamic in terms of leadership of CBD as well as access to it. And I think it's interesting to reflect on the drivers of CPD as well, that of course, frequently in an education or a school context, but even other professional contexts, they'll be driven by improvement priorities or development priorities within individual contexts for individual people or groups. But also we need to leave space for and think about how individuals can exercise agency in order to pursue areas of passion or interest. But of course, within the recent situation we've had, Globally, but also prior to that in Hong Kong with civil unrest, we saw that a lot of CBD develops out of need, out of the immediate situation. And it's about what can we learn from when that emerges in the context of emergencies um, or immediate need, and actually how does the system actually shift um, or how does it become more malleable to enable a more agentic um, development of CBD. I think in terms of influence as well, I think uh, it's been mentioned, but we can't ignore time. And actually the, co the constraints um, has come out quite frequently in conversation with colleagues in different geographical locations when we've got things like working time agreements that exist in various professional contexts with specific allocations of hours and time and how that then has implications for what CBD they're actually able to access. And of course, as um, Pauline's alluded to as well about the role of um, PRD or performance management or appraisal systems and the connection it has to professional standards in terms of framing the discourse and the expectation around CBD and what that then leads to in terms of what becomes the norm within a system or professional context. So overall, I think it's been a really, really exciting and interesting paper and I think there's going to be lots to come from this as well. And I think what I wanted to just end on was the importance of the um, feature in the paper on the role of research. I think this is something we could really usefully explore further within the context of USIT, within IPTA as well, about how we move to models of perhaps more conceptual use of research, both in policy making and in practice, about how is research used as, instead of something to be applied, actually a framework for problematizing, understanding the self, the context of practice, and how we engage within the system itself as well. So a really exciting paper. The two questions that I'm left with are, how do we actually define what is powerful career-long professional learning or CBD and how do we actually measure the impact and then I guess a sub-question of that that I will absolutely end on is do we need to measure the impact is what I'm left wondering. So thank you for the paper and thank you I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. Thank you very much Paul and Pauline. I've written in the chat that if people have got questions then do put them there but I just wanted to follow up some of those points if I may. Uh, very briefly, um, one of my major concerns is exactly the point that you have alluded to there, Paul, uh, directly and indirectly, and that is about the inclusivity of the CPD opportunities. And that, you know, the more the influence of marketization and commercialization of CPD occurs, which we are seeing, I'm not saying good or bad, but I am saying that it makes a difference with regard to access. Uh, and so one, there are several groups that I work with that are fundamentally attempting <laughs> to have a principle of inclusivity in the work they're doing. One of those is the work that's been done uh, by Marilyn Leesk with the MESH guides and Sarah Uni and has recently been reported through the ISET uh, and MESH events uh, and I will find that link in a minute and put it into the chat. So that's one group of people who are, uh, if you like, apolitical and they are attempting to bring through um, online resources and opportunities, um, various oppor CPD opportunities like this one, in fact, um, where it is, as long as people have got broadband <laughs> and a laptop, uh, that, that the income and the fee side of things uh, is not a barrier to involvement. Uh, and the other group that I work with, and I have already put this in there, and Pauline also works with, and several other people in the group, is um, a more localised group of West Midlands CPD leaders. 
and again back in 2016 in report to in response to the english standard coming in for professional de development they began a project with um members of staff from cure who you may or may not be familiar with but led by philip accordingly uh, and we've been working on again an open access um well it is a bit of a jigsaw actually um but a process that is available to leaders of professional learning um to as a way of organizing and um customizing if you like to individual needs of professionals in their in their setting i've put the link in there if people are interested to look at that but that that's been a local initiative um but it has been made available um through it and through um various other fora uh, to people who might find that a useful tool in their setting again you know um on either zero cost or very low cost um access to to that and it's also uh, underpinned by a range of case studies uh, and that is really targeted at cpd leaders but is accessible to all um so as i say inclusivity is a big issue especially as um we have increasing involvement uh, from a from the commercial sector um in the offers particularly to schools uh where the costs are quite prohibitive for some members uh, of the teaching profession um so that that was one point but the other thing about inclusivity i think is are these dialogues and so the more we can hopefully use these dialogues i noticed that you said paul and lisana that for the first time ever in my involvement because i i do the research an international one in recent history uh, i go to that meeting and actually your paper came to us uh, and i was yeah. delighted that it had gone across you set um to to get the involvement of the other groups because i think it is something that directly affects all of us absolutely and i think also that's how we came to talk about this this particular event isn't it linda because we met as a at a ipta england conversation to think how can we amplify this more mm -hmm. absolutely so um there are various things arriving in the chat uh yes suzanne is asking uh, a question close to my heart so i will i will just uh, do you want to voice that suzanne well i'm i'm always a little bit radical and a bit um, cheeky i just think i just think it is interesting more than anything to think about how we conceptualize learning and how we conceptualize development and i've heard paul campbell say a couple of times this morning career long professional learning and i just wonder whether i mean we we use this handy little acronym don't we cpd but i just wonder whether it's time to turn away from that mm -hmm. and towards a new a new term which in its own right by using a new term we're turning away from how things were so it's just me being a bit kind of obsessed with concepts and words and that kind of thing but i think it's important and that's why i've raised mm -hmm. it i guess and yeah. just chip in on that before the people comment mm -hmm. i mean i always go for the biggest umbrella i can find <laughs> um if, but really the, the you know to encapsulate the full range of potential opportunity and because presumably because of my background and my beliefs and so on and so forth i almost always try to use professional learning as the concept um because mainly because of what cpd is come to mean to some of our professional colleagues you know in other words in the past you know they'll they'll talk about the infamous baker days uh, you know of, of a, a day when we all get shoved into one room and sort of have to listen to somebody who's trotted along to talk to us about some sort of policy agenda but i mean that's evolved over time but the, the the i think there are potentially some negative connotations for people of cpd so i that's my rationale partly for professional learning but of course i work in university don't i uh, and therefore learning is central as far as i'm concerned so I, i just wish the universities had recognized that learning is their main <laughs> occupation <laughs> 
if I could just add to that, if that's all right, just really briefly, I think it's a really important question, Suzanne, because I mean, I've got huge issues with um, certain vocabulary because vocabulary does matter. I think it's the same, we could say the exact same, the difference between when we talk about practitioners or professionals, potentially. I think they'd have different connotations, different inferences that are made from that use of vocabulary. I think when we talk about development, the associations that frequently go with that are quite technical and managerial, potentially. Whereas when we're talking about learning, it's something that's much more organic, it could be personal, it's about connections, it's not tied to particular programs. And actually the role of power and ownership is different. Um, and I think the associations that policymakers, practitioners make, um, practitioners can't believe I've just used that word because we're just talking about it, uh, professionals might use, um, and the associations they have because of the history that go around these concepts, I think is really important, but the vocabulary absolutely does matter. And it's about actually taking the time to define what it actually means. But I think when we talk about development and learning in particular, development, I think we associate more managerial technical aspects that teaching is something that's easily described and prescribed and so is the CP that goes with it. But it's the same when we talk about teacher training or teacher education. I mean, Scotland's now made that distinction that they talk about initial teacher education because the process of educating teachers is different to training someone or training teachers. It's again about the associations that go with it. So I think it's a never ending conversation, but it's an important one. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. But, you know, the conceptualization of this is, is totally key to the profession. Um, and also it's key to my you know thing of inclusivity as well about whether people it's, think it's for them. Can I just turn to Deb? Because she's put in the chat, uh, if you're there, Deb, um, about the um, recent developments on the ECF and the MPQ. And I just wonder if you'd just like to elaborate a bit on that because actually it's the counter concept isn't it from with regard to the to how the government handle things hello i think the part of the big conversation that's difficult to have when you're talking about it in an international context is now the difference of the national systems and the, the, the common concept with the English system is that it's five or 10 years behind the American system usually, isn't it? And what we've seen in the English system is so much shift. And you touched on the whole kind of concept earlier on of marketization. And you know, rightly or wrongly, whatever we feel about that, clearly with the market review this summer and the Institute for Teaching, in the English system, we are now moving completely to an expectation that schools purchase this in a standardized model that's department for education approved through these named number of providers and that's actually quite a long way away from the very nice space in which you're framing the discussion this morning um, and, and that's the tension isn't it for us yeah. as people who are passionate about professional development there are a lot of people on this call today who've spent their entire lifetimes trying to give teachers that professional that sense of ability to develop professional identity and agency um, and now we're we're still going back to that done to model um uh, and that's you know uh, problematic for many of us on on many levels really yeah absolutely that the, the challenge which was sort of in my my few words earlier i think the challenges on the ground really need to shine through very much we we need to you know really shine a light on that in terms of, of that whole aspect of attempting to provide um, continuous professional development or professional learning uh, whatever term we're actually using it's that continuity we really have not addressed from the beginning of the profession onwards at all into uh, middle and, and leadership as we know we just have not for years and years and years um, and i would like that to shut those sort of practical challenges to shine out more in in a paper from USET or, or IPTA or, or anywhere um, and at that point I wonder if Linda if, is it possible to to hear that um, we have one or two teachers don't we here I'm sure <laughs> I hope anyway uh, and uh, is it um, may I mean um, certainly is offering a teacher's voice that would be absolutely great uh, I think at this point or have you got another idea for hearing voices um can I just say something quickly, if you don't mind? Um, I think one of the things we, we deliberately didn't do was um, to sort of really tackle the, the national situation 
because we wanted to really drill down what the principles had to be. Um, and these conversations happened way before the, the current state of play. But I think what's also important is, is that leaders, school leaders, um, if, uh, there's a great paper by Lipsky who talks about school leaders having to be, well, all of us having to be, um, well, uh, policy bureaucrats, for, uh, street level bureaucrats, and that we also need to exercise professional judgment and discretion. And also that we want school leaders perhaps also to take agency and, and to have a position on what lifelong learning means for them, for their staff and um, their colleagues. And there's a great book by Colvin Atwell, The Thinking School. I don't know if anyone's ever had a look at this one, but he actually made some very brave, bold decisions in terms of how he wanted to lead his school and what he understood to be um, professional development and lifelong learning. Um, and he talks about um, teacher leadership in teaching and learning and giving his staff agency to also engage with research, um, reflection and, and moving things forward within the, the, the community and also engaging within their own learning pathways that they wanted to choose and wanted to move forward with. So I think there's an element of perhaps also discussing how, how school leaders perhaps need to have agency. Another interesting book, because I'm, as you can tell, interested in the topic, is also by um, John Thompson and jo Johnny Utterly, who talks about putting staff first, coming back to pa Pauline's uh, point on, C uh, on um, appraisals, for example, and, and how he thinks it through in terms of what, what lifelong learning means for his, his organisation. And then this one just recently came out, Reimagining Professional Development in School, um, which I think is also an interesting one that talks a lot more about that importance of having agency and also perhaps school leaders having to think, what should it look like for us rather than it becoming the done to model? Is, is there a place and a space for us to have a position to? And can we work with our staff to think about what that should look like and can we reimagine it too? Um, I think that's really important perhaps to, to explore moving forward with future explorations and papers perhaps do you okay so in response to pauline's notion of voices uh, which yes we were getting there uh, we did talk about groups but actually given the size of our group um those people who haven't had the opportunity um to speak and i know it's a big ask for some of you um to to speak you know on in this situation uh, so taking that into account um, if people would like to just uh, respond either um, in the chat in terms of any points that they're taking away from this discussion or that have resonated with them, or if people are happy to speak, I can possibly pick on some people, you know what they say about, you know, if we can't get a volunteer, we'll have a victim. Um, um, I'm, 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 I'm reluctant to victimise. I'm just moment. trying to encourage Kate Mawson in the chat to see if she can join us. I know she's got a young daughter, so her, her background might not be ideal. But exactly. Kate's doing her ED at Warwick on this at the moment, and she's not far off completion. And I've had a couple of long conversations with her about it recently. Kate, are you? Yes, here she is. I always worry about saying something that, that completely divides the room. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've, I've read the paper and obviously had a look and listen to the podcast and, and things, and it, and it is interesting. I'm, I'm in ITE at the moment and spent 16 years in teaching before that. Um, but I'm currently looking at professional development for teaching staff based in HEIs. And it's, it's the Kennedy paper that the, the, the USET discussion paper looks at kind of circling back to what Deb was saying about these centers for PD where you can purchase these things that you can just do to staff and therefore I've ticked the box and I've done this PD seems to almost go against what the USET paper is talking about by right? mm -hmm. talking about you know um, tailored things that are that you form a space where people can engage with stuff that's personal um, and actually focused on them you know, effective PD has been shown to really only work when you've got motivated individuals doing something that they that they see as relevant to them. And, and I've got concerns that the that the USEP paper, which I really, really enjoyed reading, doesn't quite fit with this now national model of you need to purchase from these seven, nine centers 
So I, I, I've got some concerns that that maybe what we want and that we can see is effective isn't isn't quite getting out there. And I think more than that, the system, the, and I'm talking now specifically about an English context, and I, I know we have lots of better models, and Paul's already mentioned what they've done in the Scottish system recently, what they've been doing in the Scottish system for a few years, what they're currently doing in the Welsh system, miles and miles ahead, actually, in many ways of what we're doing in the English system that goes into this sort of, again, Anglo-American type model, but I think it, it is a it is a problem because perhaps universities are then asked to take a back seat because of these kind of standardized models have been driven forward but the reason they've been driven forward is to meet that you know what's very clearly now put forward in the english system about the golden pipeline and the golden thread that runs through cpd that's from itte they're not calling it itte they're still calling it itt but running through the initial teacher training through all the different forms right the way up to the leadership qualifications so you know that, that's part of the problem isn't it sorry linda no need to be sorry I, i'm i'm really keen to hear it uh, about these situations because uh, i mean i know that this uh, well i have the luxurious position in not having to be engaging with the various convoluted activities of the government and their bidding systems and so on and so forth but it frightens me to death when we're talking about the big nine and the you know what ha have you because it, it is so controlled uh, in the sense of access of individuals to opportunities and i am fully au okay fait with the concept of managing scarce resources and i do understand that everyone cannot be accessing everything all the time uh, based on funding from the government but it is a massive worry i think um that people are uh, it's being presented in this way you know that these are the things on offer this is the way forward and it, it's in exactly the opposite direction of some of the principles that are outlined in the paper, isn't it? Uh, about, you know, and certainly a principle that we've always worked to, which is about the needs, the needs of professionals. Uh, and those needs are quite broad and particular. And if they just don't happen to fit somebody's neat and tidy world, um, then what is on offer for them for, in terms of professional learning? So I am still keen to hear from other people in the group, either in the chat or otherwise. Um, but um, well, Linda, that... my, my, I mean, has a... My yes, has yes a... I'd, like, I'd like to add to what Kate was saying and uh, what um, when I first wrote to, in the chat. Uh, my name is uh, Maya Minalte. I have been a teacher for more than 20 years in the UK. Then I became a supply teacher while doing my PhD. And now I'm working at Qatar University uh, in the School of Education. I work as a teacher, mentor, and at the same time, I teach a train inside and outside uh, the, uh, the local context international schools. Um, like here, like we did in the UK, we have the senior leaders, our head teachers. They think, OK, this is what teachers lack without going back to the teachers. This is what you guys need. This is what you, we need to train you out. What This is what you need to be trained at without coming to us teachers asking us, what do you want? What do you lack? What is the problem of what you have? What's your problem in the classroom that you want support in? They bring us these big names of providers and they're the best and look at them and they have the best ranking and they've they've used it in that school and that school and that's good and when we look and we speak to other schools and teachers and we say to them what did you get out of it and they say oh it was nothing it was boring oh I didn't get nothing why because we forget to ask the teachers um what I've been doing for the last two years I've tried to to do it the other way I go into school and ask the teachers, what do you guys want? Some of them come up and say, um, I don't know how to manage my classroom. I don't know how to uh, uh, mark correctly. I don't know how to uh, set up, for example, online courses or something like that. Then I go to the providers and find somebody who can come in and help them. 
And then at the same time, I go back to the teacher and look for look at the feedback that she's written. Did you get anything out of those suppliers? And then I go back to the suppliers and say, yes, she did, but we need Y, X, Y, Z. Can you come back and do this with them? Or can you go back to that teacher and uh, understand where she lacks? So that's the thing that I am finding. It's the same in the UK and it's all over, even international schools here in Qatar and even the local schools, that the teachers are the last people when it comes to their training, their support, their teacher education, we forget to ask them, what do you want? And thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm with you all the way there. Um, there are, there's always, you know, at least two sides to that process isn't there and, and you're highlighting the one that is regularly um the one that gets um omitted uh, and it is all around this inclusivity agenda but I, I was speaking to a colleague in uh uae recently and they have their ofsted system i'll just use this to exemplify in this ofsted system recently the school was deemed to be to have ineffective teachers. And the response to that is, okay, what do we do about ineffective teachers? Um, not to look at, you know, and it was ineffective leadership as well. So that was very interesting, but you know, it's, it's like CPD, and I am using that acronym deliberately, CPD in their heads is some sort of sticking plaster uh, to improve uh, individuals performance you know it's like a treatment it's, it's almost you know like the sort of medical model uh, okay we'll fix you by putting you through this you can go and do this test uh, you can go through the obstacle course and you will see you'll come out a much better and improved version um Carrie do you want to make the points that you were making in the chat yourself or great yeah, so I just think um, in Ireland, definitely, and I know Paul has just come in with something quite similar there to say he agrees, but whilst we've been made um, kind of, you know, exposed much more to the opportunities to engage with different uh, professional learning opportunities, let's say, because everybody kind of opened up uh, their, their classroom doors and whatever, and we were able to engage with things we never were able to engage with before. It also started to show that there's massive inequalities in the professional learning opportunities or what resources are made available to us if you work in different sectors in Ireland. So, you know, we were kind of looking a lot at what we've got a, a particular group, the Professional um, Development Service for Teachers who work with our post-primary teachers. And they had a huge, we were able to see that they have a huge amount of resources, supports, teams that go into second level schools and who work with their teachers and then in higher education we've got a national forum for teaching and learning so I'm in further education and I had never known about either of these two different things because you're so siloed within your own sector so then we were able to see that the national forum for higher education and for working with lecturers had this huge amount of resources open courses different things you could engage with as a lecturer and then within further education, um, we're only moving into a space now where we have uh, within our education and training board. So there's 16 different groups that are broken up nationally. We've just started to have uh, coordinators appointed in each of those areas to work with staff on professional learning and development. And we're totally in our infancy in, in being able to support. So while we're doing things um, and we work really collaboratively, collaboratively together as coordinators. There's these other massive big kind of platforms that are there that we're not all feeding into each other and using the experiences or coming together to see how those things have worked. You know, what can we learn from them? What can we take from them that we can use within um, further education or perhaps you know what, what higher education can learn from educators within further ed so I just think that it's it's this huge space where it's like oh my god we've got all of these things available to us but 
you know, where's the joined up thinking in any of that? Where where are people sitting down at a table together and saying, we've got this, you've got this, let's come together and see how we can pull these things and make things more effective and efficient for everybody. So that was just what I was coming in with there, Linda. Okay, absolutely. Well, we did talk about breakout groups and Disana can put us into a couple of breakout groups for about 15 minutes to just gather up any other thoughts from people uh, in smaller groups uh, and uh, and then we'll just come back together to sum up for a few minutes um, after that. So Lizana is going to pop you into a group. Uh, do you want to say something about that Lizana? Right, yes, we are going to move into four breakout rooms. Um, you will have 15 minutes. I will give you a warning, sort of a, a minute in, and then I'll bring you back to the main room as well. Okay. Can I, can I just okay. say, um, Lizana, um, before we go um, into the groups, I think the, the point about um, where another paper, I think um, Pauline was talking about this, this is what we're very interested in is, is what's coming out of the conversation already is how sort of a spot the difference. Here's a load of very well-informed principles about CPD. Here is a policy direction. How are those things um, not aligning? And if we can get those specifics and those examples that you're sharing, I think that will really point towards mm -hmm. the next paper, which I think needs to be a bit mm -hmm. more combative now that we've actually got this, uh, this statement of, of principles. But I think that's kind of what we're looking for out of the, the discussions now, I think, is that right? Yes, absolutely. And we also had a question that we thought colleagues could respond to, which I will pop into the announcements as well. We wanted to ask um, to what extent can you see the principles reflected in your, your current context and what would you like to see in future CPD? So if you have anything that you want to add to those questions, that would be really helpful as well. But I will pop them into the announcements for you so that you have it in your, in your rooms as well. So I'm about to move you into these. Um, it will take a few minutes and then you will be with each other as well to discuss it further. I shall, I shall also pause the recording so that you can speak freely in your rooms as well. Okay, we're about to go. Oh, there you go. So. All to be expected. They've been, they've we've come under the influence of the sunshine, I'm sure. <laughs> Such a beautiful day. There was a number attached to the group, so I'm going to be very brave and I am going to say that I think I was in group one and therefore Mayamin is going to, is that the right pronunciation? It is, is Mayamin. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I, I was pushed into talking, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're pleased. <laughs> Um, we were talking about giving a teacher's voice and giving her the right to have her own CPD. At the same time, we said, uh, my colleagues were saying that when you have given a teacher's voice, sometimes the voice is too much and then uh, nothing comes out of it. So when it comes to uh, giving a teacher's voice and making her understand, or him or her, sorry, uh, understand that this is their voice and this is their uh, CPD, there should be a strategy with it there should be a follow up with it. So we can't give uh, them um, voices without helping them out to understand what that voice means and how they can interact uh, with their professional development and their CPD. Um, and we got lots of ideas about going to your head teacher, discussing the head teachers and the principals, and they can come back with the correct CPDs and and even the, the follow-up. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if that's enough. Uh, my team, team number one, or do you want to add anything? So I'm giving you a voice now. <laughs> I'm giving you a CPD. <laughs> Harry or Kate, do you want to add anything? No, I think that was it. It was just really about, you know, that if, if we're going to give voice and, we're, and we want to be able to empower teachers to take part in that, then there's also resources and supports that have to go with that. So you need to be really conscious that you've got those things in place to be able um, to deliver when you've given people voice and, and they want something and they need it. Do you have the resources and supports there or is it just going to be another paper that's produced, um, you know, or a strategy or a statement? that gets put there without something to back it up and something tangible to back it up. Thank you for that, Carrie. Thank you. Okay, is there a group two?
Ms. Anna? Um, yes, I, I popped in the chat the, the leads for each group for you as well, Linda. Um, it's Paul Campbell's group. I am chatless. Hang on, I'll get that. Um, so it's Paul, um, Paul Felton, Pauline Smith and Suzanne Goldshaw. Okay, Paul, did you have a speaker, a representative? We you? didn't actually, but I wonder, Suzanne, I know you always take copious notes. Would you like to feedback? Um, yeah, well, can, I, can I just say I was the only person in the room whose name didn't start with P-A-U-L. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had some interesting conversations about um, what to do next so after the paper and we talked about uh, well I mentioned uh, the notion of appreciative inquiry and how turning towards the principles and, and maybe getting some ideas of of the lived experience of those um, principles uh, to highlight to illuminate that that there are pockets of those kind of things happening um Paul, you talked about, um, we talked about change and how the fact that what we're saying is that there's a need for change and how change can be uncomfortable and how people embrace it, how some people resist it. But this is about the leadership of change in many ways. Um, I didn't take notes actually today, Paul, because I was I was listening. But um, and then towards the end, Paul was talking about um, actually taking the principles and um, going forward as perhaps um, a USET IPTA kind of collaboration and looking at some documentary analysis of kind of policy and, and that kind of stuff and then maybe looking for vignettes of lived experience so if I've missed anything out um, I apologize we were very interested in Paul Fallon's um, uh, context and how he, in his role he's looking at a model um, a Dutch model um, that is a, a two-week model of teachers kind of collaborating connecting and, and, and kind of checking in with each other and we also talked about how um education doesn't always look outside of itself to other disciplines and and to look at professional learning kind of outside of education because there's a lot of good stuff going on out there that we can maybe be learning from so i hope that captures what we talked about thanks very much suzanne i just want to say that we do we certainly echoed uh, group one about the importance of resources and systems uh, you know and uh, actual time for those and space for those professional dialogues to to take place but yeah just to echo that we we would love to work with you set on a uh, next paper that is ipta with you set over to you lizana um great and then room three is uh below um jane and paul where we had lots of really interesting conversations going on and, and I suppose some of the things that kind of to summarise is one key thing that kind of Bill Al put forward was this idea that, you know, it's really hard to focus on something if you're being forced to do it. And, you know, as we look at the early career framework, particularly, uh, you know, we're going to be taking these, you know, young, um, new teachers, so to speak, and we're going to be suddenly thrusting them into doing this two year of the early career framework, whether they're kind of like it or not, um, because that's what they need to do. So we said how important it was for people to be kind of willing to do things and also how we need to contextualise things so that we understand what the need is. So we sort of then sort of summarise that by thinking about, well, really, it's all about need. It's all about willingness. It's all about the opportunity then to do it and then the chance to then use it and go further forward with it. But we felt underpinning that and took that some kind of touching on what Pauline's just been saying about um, resources then to be able to do it. You know, we can't always assume everybody does have the resources they they need. You know, we talk about you know broadband, um, laptops, etc. Not everybody will have access to all of those all of the time, and also then time really was you know underpinning it all. You know, workload. How do we manage the opportunity for people to develop and learn more? if there isn't the time for them to do it, the time to perhaps attend um, some sort of learning opportunity, but then actually the time to go away and do something with it and to reflect on it further and actually use it. And I know Paul wanted to chip in with a little bit more to go with that. Okay, cheers, thanks Jane. Um, that covered everything I can think of there, apart from the, the bit I was going to add was um, the, the notion of the framework and the way you, you have to work through it and it, it is a bit kind of off-putting when you look at the, and the amount of material and you just start with section one, part one, 1 1.1 1 .1, and you think I've got loads of this to go through um, and what we what I was just shared there in the group was um, 
a framework that we actually put together in a research project. It was for teacher development, for, for education, for sustainable development. Um, and it's called Around a Sense of Purpose. There's actually a link to it in the USET paper. And the reason it was, I was kind of interested in it was um, because we, we realized the framework was kind of almost counterproductive. It was saying, these are all the things you need to know. Well, actually, by presenting it as a palette rather than a framework, rather than a matrix of four by three, we said, put it on an artist's palette. There are 12 competencies in this framework, 12 blobs of paint. Now, you as the teacher, you know your context, you know who you're training, you know who you are, you know what you know, you know where you are, you know when it's happening. And so that context would impact on what combination of those that framework you're going to use. And it will be unique learning episodes depending on the context you're in. And that also opens up the, the artistry of the work. It's not slavishly going through boxes to be ticked. It is you as a creative, agentic teacher developing a, a program unique to the context. Yes, there's a framework, but it's not delivered in, a, in, that, in that way. You are mixing and matching and coming up with creative and new, you can add colors to this palette as well. It's not just the things on the palette. So that's a, a whole different approach to using a framework. Um, and so that's why I thought, yeah, why can't we present this as a palette of options rather than a, something to be ticked through, whether or you're ready for it or not. Um, but anyway, that's uh, that. Can I, can I just mention, I did put this in the chat earlier and I was going to mention it then, but I, I, it was, this conversation was flowing, so I didn't want to interrupt it. But that is exactly the kind of approach that was taken by this West Midlands Forum. And mm -hmm. I've put the link in there. Uh, it's called a pathway, but there's, there's, it's not, the idea is you can choose, you know, you can take the road less taken, uh, uh, travelled by or whatever first words are. Um, and, you know, there are lots of different pathways. It's it's actually hexagons rather than the, the actual palette, but the idea was exactly the same, that we, you know, this is not what we want. We do not want a checklist. We do not want to teach a, a CPD standard that is about, you know, doing things in this way in a particular order. We wanted it to support people to meet the standard. Um, but that we wanted them to have lots of choice, lots of dialogue, all the things you're talking about. And I did just raise in our little group about, you know, in the dim and distant past when I was based in secondary schools, that a lot of the things that have had most impact on me were the things that we worked together on collaboratively, the teachers, around something that we wanted to change and that we had support to put those things into place within the context and that's really along the lines that uh, of the discussion that was going on that you know if you want teacher voice and you need to have teacher involvement you need it to be something that they um, feel need for build confidence through doing and you know be, uh, become more aware of what it is they do need if they're asked about those questions about what we'd like to do. And that, okay, it well, involves time for people to work together. Um, but again, um, why wouldn't you um, target some time for people to work through development ideas within within a specific context? So yeah, absolutely. Um, Fantastic, and in room four, we've got Deb, James and Laura. Mm -hmm. Well, I really feel like either James or Laura should speak here because I have just learned so much and I had a lovely breakout room. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, James. So just highlighting a study that James and Laura did together, introducing Laura to lesson study. And I'm just trying to put the link up. I found your collective ed paper, both of you that you have published last year. So you just tell everybody a little bit about it because it's just a lovely glimmer of light of the way in which the system should be working. It was a really beautiful conversation. Laura, I'll leave it up to you. I think you're the better person to speak about okay. this. Okay, just to give you a brief idea, um, we are both from Malta and um, I was a teacher for 13 years in a primary school teaching art. I was the only art teacher in the school and I had just finished my master's in education and leadership and management in 2018. And I felt I needed 
a new challenge. And in fact, I was introduced to lesson study. I was in, um, informed about it. However, my first reaction was, I can't engage in a professional development opportunity, which engages teachers working together because my context did not, did not allow it. However, working uh, with James and uh, the Faculty of Education in Malta, um, at the University of Malta, I realized that lesson study as a professional development opportunity could still be done. And in fact, um, together with James as the lesson study facilitator, I engaged in a lesson study for eight weeks. And um, it was a very fruitful um, opportunity where I learned and developed. I, I feel I did both. And um, I feel that it was an opportunity for me to, although I used to work on my own, I managed to make networks, not just within my school, although it was not that possible, I managed to, to engage with discussions with other experts, with even on, on Twitter, for example, I engaged in networks. I tried to reach out to other educators, even if not physically possible at school. Although since my context did not allow it, I tried to reach out. And I feel that um, as a teacher, I was given the opportunity to find what I need, the kind of development that um, I required, the type of, of PD that fit my needs at that time. And together with, with James, then we, we wrote when we published our paper in the International Journal for Learning and Lesson Studies, where we, we showed what the experience and type of learning that happened through this experience. I don't know if you would like to add something, James. Well, um, I think what was striking for me um, in the case of uh, Laura is that generally in Malta, uh, school leaders provide professional development for teachers of mathematics, English, Maltese, the core subjects. Generally, um, not considering teachers who are teaching art, music, teachers who are the only teacher at the school. So generally they provide CPD that mainly is directed towards teachers of general subjects. So let's say they have 80 staff, they say, okay, with this, you know, if I do this kind of CPD, then I would reach at least 50 of them. And it's always the art teachers, it's always those teachers who are an only teach, a lonely teacher in a school who are missing on these CPD opportunities. And in the case of Laura, lesson study was actually directed to address her particular needs because she identified an aspect in her teaching that was really, she was really struggling with or the, her students were actually finding it difficult to, 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 to address. And I think what was striking about Laura as well was that she did not only want to, you know, change the way she was learning at her own uh, place of work, but she also tried to reach out to others because she couldn't do it in, uh, within her own school. Within her own school, she couldn't, she didn't have the time to meet other people and also to um, uh, engage in conversations with other art teachers because there were no other art teachers at her school. But then she managed, you know, to uh, engage in conversations with an art expert from the Faculty of Education, with other teacher educators from the Faculty of Education, from other PD um, leaders working in different institutions in Malta. And together, she managed to do this lesson study. She invited people to observe her lessons. And I think it was not only Laura that, that learned from this, but myself and many of the people involved really learned a lot about the potential and the robustness of a PD model like lesson study, which has uh, components that are really effective towards you know, uh, bringing change in teachers. And in Laura's case, it brought a lot of changes. I think she managed to make networks with um, in different directions, and that has helped her, you know, to develop both her leadership skills, but also her teaching, and the way she can now support others in learning. As I said, just a lovely ray of sunshine about what professional agency and the development of professional agency and what real continuing professional development could and should look like. I thought it was a really great example. And I'm sure there are lots of individual case studies like that that could easily be wrapped up into the sort of work you're doing from this USET CPD work with IPTA. Can I just say that th thank you for sharing that. And I really, what, what you um, brought out, which we haven't really touched on, in, it's in the paper, is the power of um, 
teachers getting engaged in their own research and lesson studies, simply reflecting, being a reflective practitioner. And we've talked about, you know, what do you need? What's the need? What's the opportunities? What resources? But actually engaging any professional in reflecting on their practice and on the field they're in um, is an incredibly powerful form of CPD um, and, and just learning for life. But it's not something that is prominent in the early career framework. And uh, again, another another spot the difference opportunity there, I think. But, but, but yeah. thank you for that and, and for sharing the paper. Absolutely. And I, I think just to add to that, I thought this is a great example of collaborative professionalism, where the teacher had agency to work with um, an organisation of choice and also other professionals to really enrich their own learning and it's co-constructive. So everyone learns from it and, and there's a dialogue. Um, ongoing dialogue about practice, but also theory into practice and research into practice and learning from that. And um, I think it's a, just a wonderful example of how this could happen and organically develop, um, which I think is great and um, very individualized and very contextual. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we've heard a whole range of different let's call them professional learning opportunities uh, as i say the bigger the umbrella the better all these different uh, ideas are they're relevant in certain contexts but the point is with the principles i feel um that we need to, we can apply those principles across all those opportunities um but one thing i would we haven't really touched on this very much people have mentioned um recent developments in terms of well uh, actually uh, Maya Min was talking about this in our group um, because that's uh, one of her areas of responsibility. But this whole massive explosion of use of these kind of, you know, digital opportunities that have occurred because we've had to. And I think probably we'd all agree people have boosted their confidence enormously because they've had to suddenly go into these situations that haven't necessarily been routinely part of their um, experiences. And the other thing about that, I think, is that uh, we've all ended up, in, very interestingly to me, because this is always my problem with the digital world, we've actually got some sort of consensus about what we're using. So because of the necessity at the time, the Teams and the Zoom are very common, and then you know there might be some other few things. So we're all we're all able to talk through these common platforms. And I think this point about reaching out uh, to people in similar situations has become more of a reality to all of us. And uh, I mean, one of my doctoral students, just along the lines that you were talking about there with the lesson study, his area is modern foreign languages. And these days, how often do modern foreign language teachers get the opportunity to talk to each other he actually built it into each stage as uh, they were his participants into the design phase and they're the participants providing the feedback and so on all the way through his um in his case professional doctorate and um, because he was so keen and that is now pe paying a really big part in his professional life that he's got these like-minded souls that he's got really great access to, and they can talk about those issues around modern foreign languages that, in the similar way to yourself, Laura, that um, you know weren't available to him in a typical school situation. So, I mean, th there's all that. So, um, just to sum up then, because um, I'm sure we're all ready for a change of scene, um, perhaps, Ms. Arna and Paul, you could just sum up what you think you're taking away uh, with regard to the principles. I know you've commented as we've gone along, um, but uh, do you have any summary thoughts on what we've managed to achieve this morning? Sure. Um, Paul, do you have notes? I've, I've taken a few notes. If that's okay, I can share mine first. Um, well, basically, in summary, I, I thought from this morning, Linda, one of the big points that stood out for me is one of the point you made regarding inclusivity and the importance of access and how do we ensure that that continues to happen. Uh, Maya May's point on um, 
the importance of teacher voice and how teachers are considered in the processes and, and also exploring their individual needs, the importance of that. Um, and also the issues on the ground that was raised as well, that, that we need to reflect those challenges and tensions between the principles and the current situation. Um, the issues around time, um, again, the debate between lifelong learning and versus CPD and that journey that the teacher needs to be on and that they could also have the, the sense of agency to, to direct their own journey and to meet their needs. And then, of course, um, also the, the element of leadership and how leaders also need to be considered in this and how they could also have agency and, and um, maybe also reshape how they would want things to move forward um, generally. And um, Paul also mentioned uh, a possible collaboration um, to extend the work we're currently doing. And Pauline has also highlighted that. Um, that we could then um, continue to develop papers with ITAR and you said to, to then take this further and, and rebut this more and also look at the, the challenges we face and also um, creating vignettes and Suzanne also mentioned um, appreciative inquiry where we could also look at the current situation and the, the lived experiences and the vignettes where there are pockets of brilliant practice that we can mirror and reflect there as we've seen from the, the lovely um, example we've been shared, um, well, that's been shared regarding the collaborative professionalism and um, the lesson study that took place um, in Deb's group as well. So uh, that in a nutshell, I think, was my summary of, of what I can take away from today. Paul, anything else? It's a very well crammed nutshell. Um, <laughs> you know, you've covered nearly everything I was, yeah, I, there's a couple of points, I mean, from the nitty gritty, the tiny things like um, it was basically reinforcing the principles that we already had highlighted in the paper in many ways. Um, there was some colouring in of that sort of um, details, uh, like the appraisal performance management issue. That's that's part of what why context is so important. Where do the needs come from? How are they being identified? And just different ways in which the big point about contextualisation is is it plays out in, in different schools. Um, there's a point, I think um, Paul touched on it, we talk about sort of ecological approach to uh, the, um, the whole CPD or the, the learning environment in which you're working. I think systemic thinking um, is, is missing as well. That, that, and as you go up through the NPQs, I was saying this to Lizana yesterday, I had an opportunity to talk to the people, the DFE team responsible for the, putting the, the new professional qualifications together. And I said, right up to the chief executive level, I don't see anything on systems and systems thinking and making connections. Um, surely that's at least one area you should put in. And they said, oh, thank you for your contribution. They were published months later, nothing on systems or systemic thinking, but the box was ticked. They had consulted USET. <laughs> um, the other thing that's, that, and this is the last point I think for me is, um, yes, an IPTA USET combined kind of paper, I think. Um, being a bit more combative, you said, I think we're very much concerned with the, what is clearly an ideological battle against higher education being involved in teacher education. That's it's quite, quite clear, it's, it's, it's out there, there's nothing, there's no secret. And we're fighting for the soul of teacher education in the universities, but actually there's even a bigger fight now for and I think somebody mentioned that it was Paul again, that the, the term control is what's being exerted here through this framework, through reducing teacher learning to controlled Lego blocks that you will go through, whether you're ready for them or not. They are actually stripping out any, um, a lot of the values that underpin teachers and their work. Um, and I think there is a, a serious battle to be had here and we can't just sit back because they have so much grip at the moment. Um, We've got to come back as a profession. It's bigger than you said. It's bigger than universities. It's about teaching as a profession is being undermined here. And so um, I just think uh, something that's a bit clearer about that statement in a way that you said perhaps couldn't be um, would be very valuable. So I do look forward to the opportunity to work with IPTA on this, to this joint paper. Thank you. Lillian, do you want to respond? Uh, yes, ju just yes, just to say that was that was a great summary. Thank you very much, uh, Lizana and Paul, and and thank you, Linda, for everything that you've done. 
and everyone. It's been a, a brilliant way to spend your Saturday morning, isn't it? <laughs> and um, just to say, uh, Paul, I think that's absolutely spot on about, about the uh, teacher professionalism. Um, it, it, goes, it is a very important um, point in time uh, to continue the work that you've done on the principles now um, uh, and to take that further. Uh, we'd be very happy to, to do that. Um, just to say to everyone, we you know we have an, uh, an IPTA international conference in November, at the end of November, which I'm sure most of you have attended in some way or whatever. Uh, you know, please do join. It, it's very, it's very cost effective, but it will give the opportunity. I think <clears throat> we can certainly formulate an opportunity um, to to help with the writing of this paper if it isn't written by November, uh, uh, and we haven't captured in uh, you know significant uh, enough. Uh, significant vignettes and case studies uh, that we want to, but we'd be very happy, very willing to collaborate um, with your group, Paul. Uh, very, very happy to do that. So thank you for a very interesting morning, everyone. <laughs> yes, so it, it is a big thing from us um, that you have given us your time this morning. It's a very generous gift. We're all desperately short of it. I know that. And I hope that you are going to be taking things away of your own to think about and to do. Um, I will reiterate that we're very interested in the, developing the principles. And I, I do actually think there's a, a lot that's hopeful about working on the principles because I do think they can be applied even to the most perverse government <laughs> political move. Um, and that if we can promote those principles over and above um, these policy changes that come along every now and again, you know, with a great big fanfare of trumpets uh, and somebody throws money at something, if we can, we can encourage the profession as a whole to um, think about all these um, events, shall we say, because they are more like events they're not necessarily sustainable they're not necessarily the future uh, according to the next set of um politicians in power um so if we can have um or make a, a really strong effort to promote the principles i think then that would put the profession as a whole on a on a much safer uh, more productive pathway uh, to, to a future that we can all be um, very happy with and not feel compromised constantly um, by, by these um, political moves. Um, so I thank you all very much indeed for everybody's contribution. Uh, and um, at that point, unless we've got anybody absolutely burning to say something else, um, we will call that the formal end of proceedings for this morning.